Look, it's an honor to be here. And I, I love talking to product teams all around the world. And I love the diversity um, and the global nature of this group. Um, you know, product is near and dear to my heart. I do have a shirt that says product is hard. Um, you know, I often joke with folks that if, if product is not hard for you, you're probably not doing it right. You know, and I, I tell people too, if it's not fun, you're probably also not doing it right. Um, but, you know, today I just wanted to talk about uh, people and really at the heart of every great product in the world are really a team of people. And, uh, you know, I, I want to touch a lot on transformations and coaching product teams. Um, it, it's really important to me. I am one of uh, five product partners at, at the Silicon Valley Product Group. And truly what we do is we share with companies how the most innovative products in the world are built. And we try to convince them that they can work in a similar manner or better. You know, I, I typically, um, kind of start narrating, uh, in my journey, I uh, have worked as a product manager, uh, leader of product teams, I product executive, uh, transform product companies, and now I coach people all, all around the world. It, it was striking to me in one of the companies I worked uh, over a decade ago, a high growth company, you know, I used to have this open door policy, everybody come tell me all your problems, and kind of on the very first day, you know, I'm expecting to hear some really tactical problems about the business. Uh, you know, Derek, the designer, walks into my office, starts complaining about the engineers. I said, what's going on? Well, they built a future. They didn't involve me. It doesn't look great. It doesn't match our brand. I said, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, bring the engineer here, you know, so that I can learn more. A few minutes later, the engineer comes in, you know, starts to complain about the designer. It's like my manager can vouch for me. He calls the manager, the engineering manager is now in my office, complaining about design taking too long. Derek is upset, he feels attacked. They say, well, it's not our fault. The product manager did this. Then they bring the product manager to my office. In like less than 10 minutes, there are six people in my office just arguing about all kinds of things. I wasn't involved, it wasn't clear, there wasn't stuff. And I'm observing this uh, and looking in here and I'm realizing a ton of the dynamics you know, about people, it are not being recognized, people not working well together, collaboration, ego, stakeholder management, lack of clarity, lack of alignment, you know, and it did cross my mind because it felt like the blame game. Everybody was very good at blaming something for why things were not done. It's because of our process, our tools, lack of a clear alignment from leadership, all of those things. And so I thought to myself, well, why don't I just get rid of all the people, you know, because, you know, this was a moment of Zen for me. If people are the problem, maybe people should be the solution to as well. And it led me in my product journey to start to anchor at the core of it, that all problems truly are people problems, right? And so I started to keep track of all of the problems I faced as a leader in a product organization, and I could narrow them down every single thing to a core of problems that were people problems. Now, I do have the fortune of working with uh, lots of teams all around the world. And I typically ask the same question, like what are the biggest challenges you face? You know, regardless of company, regardless of what they are working on, regardless of where they are located, many organizations face the same kind of problem. We need more resources, communication, collaboration, uh, lack of clarity, stakeholders, misalignment. Um, you know, you start to narrow down this and you realize they are not technical problems. They are not process problems. These are really people problems. And so I went back to realize, well, if they are people problems, who is responsible for people in an organization? Well, maybe these people problems are truly leadership problems. You know, you probably heard from Matty Kagan. Um, you know, he argues heavily that in an empowered organization, people often think we need less leadership and management. And he argues that we actually need better. And this has to be the core because when you see it, people say, well, we've got smart people. We should just kind of let them do whatever they want. Well, these people need to be managed and coached. So let me be clear up front in terms of framing. Okay, because you hear me say leadership and management. The job of leadership in an organization is twofold. One, to provide context, and two, to provide culture. Context, why are we here? Where are we going? How do we organize ourselves to do this? What's important right now? And how do we know we're succeeding? Culture, 
the environment, the language, the behaviors that support us in doing the why. This is the core job of leadership. Bill Campbell, um, who we reference a lot, um, known for many years as the coach of Silicon Valley, literally the coach of Steve Jobs of Apple, Jade Bezos of Amazon or Larry and Sege Bean at Google and Letta Eric Smith. He unfortunately passed away years ago, but he argues that leadership is about recognizing the greatness in everybody and to create an environment where that emerges. Going back to context and culture, okay? Now, management is quite different. Now, in almost all cases, a leader is a manager. Right, so I'm a CEO, I have people that report to me, I manage them too as well, right? Uh, Mike is currently CTO of Etsy. Um, they wrote a great book called The Art of Scalability, but they argue that while leadership inspires people to greater accomplishment, management is to motivate them towards what's important. So let me be clear about the role of management. The role of management is to find, attract, recruit talent, to coach them, and retain them and to align them to what's important. That's it, nothing else matters. So if I called out leadership and management, the job of leaders should be to provide clarity about context, why we're here, where we're going, how we plan to get there, to provide an environment for us to do those things with the language and the behavior, that's the culture, right? And then to equip a team of people, staff them, to coach them so that they are competent and then to their potential and to point them to what's important, right? So that's the core of it. And I stress this out because I want very early on when I say leader or management for you to know what we expect of them. So I will start with some of the people problems that have been driving me crazy over the last decade, right? Because the first one, when I think about it, regardless of the company, you know, I'm going to pick on one challenge here that's always intriguing, you know, it stands out to me often. It's this thing. You know, you're going to think it's a, a groundbreaking stuff. It's meetings. Meetings. Meetings are like the drug of choice in a modern product organization. I have not met a product person, designer, leader, so that can resist a meeting with the title of their product in it. It doesn't matter what it's called. You can literally get anybody to show up if you just put what you're working on in the title of a meeting. It is the solution for everything in an organization. It's truly a people problem, right? Now, you know, I ask people all the time, why do we have so many meetings? Why are we in so many meetings? Well, I hear things like clarity, alignment, information planning communication, status updates to inform the stakeholders. We have weaponized meetings as the aspirin for all of our headaches in a product organization. I used to think it only mattered to some people. So I started to poll teams around the world. I said, okay, product managers, where do you spend your time in an average week? Meetings. I said, okay, product managers are in meetings. All right, what about designers? Where do you spend your time in an average week? Meetings too as well. I say, okay, maybe the product managers are having meetings with the designers. This is what you're talking about. So I ask the engineers, where are you spending your time? They also said meetings. And I say, whoa, no wonder we can't get anything done in an organization. But here's the interesting aspect of this. The prevalence of meetings, in, uh, or particularly for engineers, is actually directly correlated to the type of operating model you have as a team. If you have a delivery team, meaning the team's focus is just to crank out code, to deliver software, then the number one response is typically coding to this question. Engineer just spend their time cranking out code. If you have a future team, meaning you're giving a roadmap of futures and projects to go deliver, the number one response is meetings. Because I have been told what to deliver. I have no clue why it's important, what is coming next, all of those questions. Meetings become the number one response. In an empowered environment, the number one response to this question, where do your engineers spend their time, is actually solving problems. So as I do this same question all around the world, 
I can almost tell what kind of operating model you have just based on how engineers answer this question. Where do you spend your time? If coding is the number one response, we're not getting half of the value of the engineer. All you're doing is just building out stuff. If meetings is the number one stuff, we have a, a future team. They have been given roadmaps of futures and projects to go deliver. Empower teams where they are given problems to solve and allowed to come up with the best solution to that problem, the number one response should be solving problems. Now, when I think of meetings, um, I see them really as symptomatic of deep people issues within an organization. The highlights of them are really in three areas, context, collaboration, and discovery. Let's start with context. Steve Kobe kind of calls this the runaround dilemma. When people don't know what's important, well, everything seems important. <laughs> well, if everything is important, we got to do everything. Well, doing everything, well, it, it keeps us so busy, we don't have time to think about what's important. The first people problem that we need to get good at coaching and leading teams on is providing clarity around context. In a product organization, this is how it's reflected. Mission, why are we here? What's our purpose? What's our reason for being? Vision, where are we going? Go in the next three years, the next five years. If it's hardware, maybe the next 10 years. Strategy, how do we plan to get there? Right? And then our objectives and our priorities. What's important right now? How do we know we're succeeding along this journey? Biggest, you know, you, you see symptomatic meetings, root cause within a culture is really driven from a lack of clarity around the context, poor collaboration, low trust in the environment, and a lack of discovery. So I'm showing you the dynamics here that often many people coach to symptoms than to really find the root causes within an organization. One of the biggest things that has come up every time I have a talk with many product teams, someone will ask me, say, Christian, do you have a prioritization rubric or metrics? How do you decide what the team should work on? We've got limited resources. We have 700 things on a backlog. How do we know which one to do first? This was one of the hardest things for me to understand in my product career. This is truly a lack of strategy. That's what it is. See, a vision says, these are all the problems I want to solve in the next three years. You've narrowed down your problems to a couple. Strategy says, this is the most important problem to solve now. This is the most important problem to solve next. And these are the problems we will solve never. That's what strategy is. It's focus. It's saying we're going to place some bets on a few things that are highly leverageable. If you are struggling with lots of items on a backlog or things to do, you are in a future team. You're given futures and projects to go deliver. If you're in an empowered environment, you're given problems to solve. So strategy really is choosing what not to do. Right? You're achieving a key set of milestones in some logical order. So I'm showing you how a lack of strategy in context ends up creating a lack of alignment, a lack of clarity, multiple priorities, lack of focus, competition with resources. You see the people problem here? Leadership problem, not providing clarity on context. That's got to be coached. You also end up with a dilemma in which you build a team of mercenaries not missionaries, right? Missionaries are people that are connected to the why. The way I identify this in a company, I go to an engineer and I say, hey, Adi, what are you working on? He says, well, I am building an API. To, I said, oh, that's great. Why are you doing it? He says, well, uh, my product manager told me to. He's a missionary. It was the next thing assigned to me, missionary. I pulled it out of a JIRA board. It was the next work my team lead told me to do. They don't understand why they are doing it. A missionary says, oh yeah, well, I'm building that to grow our business, to double revenue, to improve customer satisfaction, to make us the best place to work, to drive differentiation. They understand the why behind it. Don't get it wrong. 
There are many cultural aspects in a company that create mercenaries. Waterfall behavior creates mercenaries. Agency models create mercenaries. When we outsource things to people, you can outsource internally. If you have one designer supporting 50 product managers, they had agency. Who, who, what do they do first? Is there anybody that goes to anybody in the company and says, I want you to do something for me? And you can take like seven years to work on it. Everybody wants something right now. So in that agency model, you're saying, how do I decide which one to do first? Right? Command and control creates mercenaries because you're just telling people what to do. See, I'm calling out these factors because I want us to connect with some of the root causes for the challenges we face within our organization. I'll pick another area, collaboration. You know, I know it's a rabbit buzzword in many spheres, but you know, I'm talking about true collaboration. What do I mean by true collaboration? It really is focused on how we solve problems, right? Companies that thrive in their product work, the most innovative teams in the world, they identify and define their problems together. They discover, validate, test the solutions they've come up with that problems together. They design and deliver those solutions together. Not sequentially, not in handoffs. It's not, a, I am the CEO and the boss. I'm going to tell the head of the leader's product to tell the product manager what to build, who will now tell the designer what to design, who will now tell the engineer what to build in there. Handoffs are very prevalent in many command and control structures. Information is sent up the chain of command. Decision is coming all the way down, right? In an empowered team, what we're really saying is you want to move information to authority, not moving information to authority. We want to move authority to information. The people that are closest to the problem, people that are built, they have all of the context. Product, design, and engineering working as one unit, right? Happened. So I'm calling out these constructs in here. And the core of it is really an empowered team. And one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes, right? Is it, we don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. We hire smart people to tell us what's possible. I look at so many product teams all around the world. We want the best of the best, the smartest, the brightest. A product manager has to be super smart, love problems. I get all of these very nicely written job descriptions, paying these people a lot of money. And then we hire them with engineers and designers and we say, go build me this. So, well, I mean, this is the core of it. An empowered team is cross-functional. These teams are diverse, they're given problems to solve, allowed to come up with the best way to solve those problems and measured on the outcomes, on the results, solving those problems. The last piece at the root of it is often this notion of discovery. Discovery at its very core means we don't know the answer when we start. You know, this is Ed Catmull of uh, uh, Pixar, one of the cool companies out there. I keep telling them I work for free, but they, they don't seem to have any problems. A great company. You know, they make movies. Look, making movies is a very expensive business. Risky too. We hear all the great movies, but more movies fail than are successful. Pixar has never had a movie failure because they actually use a tech process. They, there's a book called Creativity Inc. It's a great read. Uh, it, it talks about the, the, the way that they actually go about creating a movie. They call it discovery too. It's what I love about this mindset. We don't know the answer when we start. I see so many companies talking about requirements. Well, why are we talking about, we don't even know what we're building. We don't know if it's the best solution to the problem. I ask teams all the time. I'm like, what are you building? They say, we're building this. I said, how do you know it's the best solution? Well, because we did some research on it and everybody loves it. I said, well, for something to be the best, you have to compare it to something else. What other thing did you compare this to for you to know it's better than something else? Over and over again, ask yourself that question. How many times do you build things can you answer without a doubt that this is the best solution to the problem you've been given to solve? And it's the most important thing to do. Discovery is really focused on answering the questions. Will people buy this? Okay, it's a free product. Well, will they choose it? 
Can they use it? Can we build it? Does it work for our business? Will our stakeholders support it? This is the core of why the discipline of product exists. Because every time we build something, we are faced with risk. And the job of the team is to tackle those risks up front as much as they can with evidence and then to clearly describe what will be delivered as a result of it, right? Mark Andreessen argues here that, you know, the most important thing is to know what you can't know. That as product management, humility is really the core of our discipline. We've got to get really comfortable at understanding our job is not to validate an idea, not to prove something is right or wrong. It's to solve problems. Got to get out of the ego. This is one of the hardest things to coach at. Nothing comes good out of it. People problem, right? Another people person problem here is this other one, stakeholder management. I see that a whole lot because when I say, hey, who are your stakeholders? I get a long list from people. I say, what is a stakeholder? Someone says, uh, anybody that cares. I say, well, I care. Am I a stakeholder? Let me tell you what to do. They say, well, well, everybody that cares within the company. I said, well, let's find everybody in the company to do this. One of the biggest challenges I find with teams is they believe everybody is a stakeholder. Look at all these groups, lots of people all up in our business. If you're in a startup, your CEO is all up in your business. He loves to be friendly with product people too as well. You have to solve for all of these things. But truly, the first thing you've got to do is to understand what a stakeholder is and what they are not, right? You have to recognize there's a difference between somebody's level of influence and somebody's level of interest. You know, there's a story about the, the chicken and the pig. You know, the, the chicken goes to the pig and says, uh, let's start a restaurant. And the pig is like, I'm all in. He said, what are we going to call this restaurant? The chicken says, we'll call it uh, ham and eggs, you know? <laughs> And the pig says, whoa, I'm going to pass, you see? Because to create this ham, you've got to kill the pig. But the chicken is just contributing some eggs. A stakeholder is somebody that has veto power. Somebody that can say no, and your product doesn't go out of the door. That's a stakeholder. Everybody else is just somebody that cares. And that's okay. We want people to care. But if you truly have a stake in something, that means you should be an enabler of innovation, not a blocker. I shouldn't be coming to you for permission to do something. I should be partnering with you to solve a problem because you have a stake in the outcome. We got a coach to that, right? If not, we run into decision by committee, design by consensus. What is it for me? What radio station are you tuning to? This is what I want. I am the boss. I am the highest paid person. I'm the loudest voice. I'm the smartest person. I got you this job. You see all of the reasons to build products, right? Nothing is what happens when everybody wants to agree. At the core of this, you know, you know I love this, uh, the guru's wisdom from Mary Kagan which used to strike me in the beginning, like, yeah, 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 products are built by people. But you start to dissect it. Great products are built by great product teams. These teams are really exceptional. But when you take them out of the context of the team, these are just ordinary people that come together. One of the biggest misconceptions I meet all the time is, people say, oh, you've worked with teams at Google or Amazon or Apple. Boy, they must hire rock stars and unicorns and 10 Xers. I, I have had a chance to with you those things. I don't think there's anything special about those individuals. In almost every other company in the world, I have met amazingly talented people. What's different is the environment in which they are in. What's different is how they are supported. Because when I look at all of the problems that companies face, at the core of it, there are people problems, but the underlying dilemma is really driven around trust. Because when I ask people, why don't you empower your teams? Why don't you, why do you have so many meetings? Why can't people get along? Well, they, they come up with all kinds of reasons, conflict, ego, recognition, clarity, communication and stuff. And it really boils down to trust. 
You know, at the core of it, uh, you know, the, the five dysfunctions of a team, they truly argue that trust is at the foundational root of a ton of our dysfunctions because the absence of trust leads to a fear of conflict, which leads to a lack of commitment, which leads to avoidance of accountability, which leads to an inattention to results. Covey argues that trust is really a function of two aspects, but competence and character, right? Do you have the skills to do the job? Do we trust your intent to do the job? There are many other elements that you can look at when it comes to this, right? Uh, character trust, consistent trust, concern, community, all of these elements. And the reason I call this out a whole lot is because at the core of leadership, the only way for you to build trust is for you to trust the people. Because trust is a two-way street. Do we start with a zero balance of trust and build it up? Or do we start with a full tank of trust and lose it? There is reciprocity in trust. And this is why it's a leadership problem. It is the job of leadership to build a team of people that they can trust and equip them to do the job. So leadership truly is the people problem. And in all fairness, many leaders are very disconnected from the problems that their teams face. What they focus on is execution and process and frameworks because we want to scale. We want to grow the business. To go from one from one dollar to two dollars, I have to put layers of process in between it. And maybe add more people. And by adding more people, I need to add more process to manage the people that I have added. You see? And innovation dies. Regardless of the leadership role, I want to talk about the core of it, which is coaching. And I argue with people, you cannot get mastery in this by avoidance. You can't get better at cooking by avoiding cooking or better at driving by avoiding driving. Similarly, to get better at leading, you have to lead. To get better at coaching, you have to coach. But here is the core of it. 70% of all product managers identify as self-taught. They taught themselves the discipline. I was joking earlier, imagine going to a dentist and they're saying, yeah, I was watching some videos on YouTube and I learned how to pull teeth. Let's go, open up your mouth, right? <laughs> a very core root of our business here. Similarly with coaching, the number one reason many people have not experienced good coaching is because their leaders haven't experienced good coaching either. Coaching is what turns ordinary people into extraordinary product teams. So I want to wrap up on the coaching mindset. You know, I don't have time to teach quick techniques, but this is what I need people to anchor on in a mindset of coaching, okay, at its very core. First, it is very distressing how many few managers subscribe to the idea that developing people is the number one job. Many people talk the talk. Yeah, it's all about the team. It's all about people. Walking the talk is about coaching right? This is the number one job. Let me be clear about it. Doing the job, like if I'm an engineer, my job is engineering. Getting better at engineering is my manager's job. If you're a product manager, doing product management is your job. Getting better at product management is your manager's job. This is a very hard construct for people to understand. I meet people all the time. They say, well, you know, hey, Michael, oh, Michael, you are terrible at public speaking. Go get better at public speaking. If you think Michael could get better all by himself, he would have done it by now. Public speaking is part of Michael's job. Getting better at it is the manager's job. Say, so, well, I hire smart people. They are driven. They, their resume or their CV is 20 pages long. Well, why does Michael Jordan have a coach? Why does Tiger Woods have a coach? Why do any of the best of the best, you know, why do they still need coaching? This is the job. Your performance of a manager should not be measured on the success of the products, but the success of the team members. That's the first score. Second, they've got to believe that empowering people is the core to getting the best out of people. Many managers will see their job as driving the tax list for their team. Like, these are all the things my team has to deliver. 
My job is to make sure they deliver it. Whoa. Remember I said, empowerment doesn't mean less management, it means better management. Your job is to step back and create a space for your team to succeed, to step in and remove impediments and blockers, to clarify context, to provide guidance, to see all of the things I talked about in the environment. You want a team of missionaries, not a team of mercenaries. Connect them to the problems to solve, the why. That's how you get the best out of your team. Also got to be aware of your own insecurities. Avid is a great engineer. He's been at his company for eight years. He wins awards for engineer of the year. Everybody claps for him in the team meetings. He, you know, he has his picture on the wall, great engineer. But it's been eight years. He's been a little uneasy in his career, you know? I don't know where my career is growing. We don't want to lose Avid. He's a great engineer. So we should do what? We should promote him. What's the next thing to promote him to? Well, engineering manager is the next thing. So we promote Avid to engineering manager. Avid said, this feels right. Now Avid has never been a manager in his entire life. He's never hired people, fired people, talked to people and stuff. Now, after about three weeks, Avid realizes uh, he no longer gets praise. Nobody's clapping for him at meetings anymore. Nobody's recognizing him as a cool employee. He's feeling very uneasy. And because he's a manager, he cannot ask questions like, uh, how do you interview people? How do you deal with difficult, because you're now a manager, how dare you not know the answer to all of these questions? The very next week, a problem, an engineering problem comes across Avid's desk. Avid jumps in and solves the problem. Avid doesn't realize that his job has changed. His job is no longer to solve the problem, but to coach the team on how to solve the problem. This is because Avid is a better engineer than he is an engineering manager. The story I just told you is really the origin story of a concept people call micromanagement. People often think people were born micromanagers or they just grew up with this stuff. But in some ways, insecure managers have a hard time empowering people. They are worried about being recognized for their contribution. They even see their team's success as a threat to that recognition, that confirmation for the work that they are doing. So they will deal with this by controlling how the team works, by controlling the team's visibility to leadership. Truly bad managers will undermine their team. I'm calling out some really heartfelt issues here, but this is at the core. This is what needs to be coached in our work, right? You also have to understand very clearly that, you know, you've got to cultivate diverse points of views. A, a, an insecure manager will suppress opinions that are different from the other. This impedes the development of your team. You have to recognize that there's not a consensus on good ideas, that the best ideas come from the diversity of teams. Teams are deliberately made up of people that are not the same, no matter the sport. They are always different roles, different skill sets, because there's a recognition that what we want to accomplish cannot be done by an individual. This is why we bring a team, right? It's also the job to seek out teaching moments. You know, I typically will ask a team like, well, how does anybody learn how to take money from an ATM machine? Think about it. Did you go to school in a banking school? Did you watch a YouTube video? No, you literally just walked up to the ATM machine and it taught you how to take money out of the machine. This is what you call a point of need. People learn at a time of need. When things change, they want to learn. When they are learning something for the first time, when they want to solve a problem, when they need more, I just got promoted, I need to learn more. All of these dynamics drive a need for change. And good leaders seek out these moments to coach and develop their, their people. They also recognize they have to have the courage to correct mistakes, to give critical feedback, to praise in public and, and, and direct people privately. It's about developing. And if people are not working out, they manage them out of the company because it's not good for you. It's not good for your team. It's not good for the individual. It hurts all of those people. 
And finally, they have to continually end the trust of the team. It's not something that you can demand. You end the trust continuously by your commitment to the success of other people or to your team members. How do you do this? I typically start with onboarding, but there are many coaching tools. When I think about coaching, your coaching, culture, aspects of thinking, being an owner, collaboration, managing time. You're starting with onboarding, one of my favorite coaching techniques. Why? Because if you think about it, when somebody joins a company, they have the highest trust for the organization, but the organization has the lowest trust in them. It's a very wet dynamic, right? Natalie left her former job, who paid her a salary, quit it, went to LinkedIn and announced to everybody, I am now joining this company. The company has never paid her a dime. Joins the company with the hope that some magical Friday or date, money will show up in her bank account. They are very high and excited. But when they join the company, the company says, I don't know you. I heard you came from Google and Amazon, but you don't know our business. You don't know how things work here. You haven't proven yourself here. Let me see what you do. And you know what we often do? We just throw that person into the team. Go build products. The team is like, okay, I don't know you either. You don't know us. Good luck. And then the product person is confused on what to do. Then the second a leader says, I think we should build this. They're like, thank you. This is what we're going to do. They have just thrown away their empowerment because they are now taking instruction because they are not competent in the industry, the business that you're in. No matter how good somebody is, mm -hmm. they do not have the level of competence in their role to succeed. They have to be coached. So I start at the beginning. I do a boot camp. I welcome people, I train them, I spend weeks, I bring the team they are working on, we practice safely, we build trust, we build relationships, we build dynamic. Because what? Doing the job is yours, getting better at the job is the job of the manager. You've got to develop people. And to do that, you've got to assess them, identify their gaps. That is at the core of it and build a plan. You say, well, I found out you are terrible at communication. Okay. Whose job is it to get you better? It's the manager's job. They create a coaching plan for you. They walk that through over and over again. Every single dynamic that you struggle with in a product organization can be coached. Well, the, the leadership doesn't have a good vision. They put out the vision, but I don't understand it. If in every one-on-one, -on -one, your manager spent time to explain the vision to you in a manner that you understand, you will know the vision. Meetings, coaching problem, communication, can be coached. All of these aspects. Someone said to me, well, Christian, you've never seen my one-on-ones. All my employees want to do. These product people, they just come in and complain. Oh my goodness, it is so hard. They whine, money. Whine. That's why I tell people all the time. If you are a product leader, your job is part-time therapist. Get over it. Remember I told you before, if product is not hard, you're not doing it right. These people are managing an infinite amount of stakeholders, an ever-growing number of customers. They come to work and take emotional and sometimes verbal abuse from people. Everybody wants something and they want it now. Your job as a leader is to create an environment to improve people, to develop them, get them competent, and then to their potential. Last piece here, we argue that if we get the culture right, this is Tony Shi from a founder of Zappos. Uh, he passed away early last year, if you get the culture right, most of this thing also falls in place. And culture is a leadership problem. And when I look at all big major transformations out there, at the core of it, the companies that have successfully transformed in the way they work, in how they drive value, in their focus on customers, these are the elements that I see consistently. They get support from the top. They change the way of technology, the role of technology from a necessary evil or a cost center to becoming their business, an enabler of value. They truly collaborate. They build a strong product management discipline. Strong product leadership is at the core because they provide the vision, the strategy, the, the objectives. Then they hire people. Then they coach those people. They retain those people. 
You build true product management discipline. Empowered engineers, they understand the why. They have clear strategy. A lot of these elements here are truly people problems, right? One of my favorite quotes um, from the book, The Sun Also Rises, um, is written by a, a, this NS Hamilton book. You know, he said, hey, how did you go bankrupt? Build Axe. He says, well, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And, and it resonates with me because I, I recall like Blockbuster, you know, a $6 billion company going bankrupt in six years and the rise and advent of uh, Netflix. But, you know, typically many people have all these stories of how companies fail. Everybody's happened. It happens gradually and then suddenly the company's gone. And so I often get the question from people, it's like, well, how will we transform? How do we work differently? When will all of these things change? And I say the same thing. Gradually and then suddenly. So you end the story of a leader at Chick-fil-A. Uh, if you've ever been to Chick-fil-A, it's a chicken chain in the US. Um, when you say thank you to any person in the company, they always say, my pleasure. No matter what Chick-fil-A you go to, this restaurant, anywhere, they always respond the same way. You say, well, how did this happen? Well, the founder had that comment and he went to everybody in the company to say it. It was a small company in the beginning days. I said, well, how long did it take for everybody in the company to respond the same way when they were told thank you? You know what the answer was? Six years. Six years for a company to just say thank you. And I say this because often people that I coach and I companies are, they want magical solutions, overnight effects. We've moved to Agile. All of our problems should go away. Well, Agile is a people problem. We try tech ops, CICD, all of these things. None of those things fix your problems. That very cultural, deliberate leadership and coaching. Last piece I'll leave you here with. Uh, just to kind of iterate some of my mindset around this. I, uh, I, I used to work remotely uh, and travel to a different location uh, for work. And I'm coming back on this trip, uh, getting to an airplane. And there's a lady sitting beside me uh, with a basket kind of, of cupcakes. They are beautiful decorated cupcakes. And I'm eyeing her cupcakes as I'm sitting down. She's looking at me. She's like, dude, take a cupcake. And I said, no, I don't want a cupcake. You're like, please take a cupcake, you know? So I take a cupcake and I eat these cupcakes and I don't eat a lot of cupcakes, but these were amazing cupcakes. So I said, whoa, this is a really good cupcake. She's like, yeah, everybody tells me this. I, this was the holiday season. My family went to me to bake cupcakes. I baked too much. So I'm taking some home. I'm like, oh, these are great. Do you have a cupcake business or shop? She's like, no, whoa, a cupcake business. Like uh, that's a lot of work. You know, I, I have to start a restaurant, hire employees. I've thought about it. I don't even know how to start. This is so overwhelming. I said, well, do you like to bake cupcakes? She's like, yes. I bake cupcakes all the time. It's one of my favorite things to do. I said, well, I don't know if people really love your cupcakes. It could just be me and your family. You know, we could be telling you all kinds of stuff. Uh, do you have a break room in your office? She said, yes. I said, well, why don't you bake some cupcakes and, you know, go there during your lunch break and see if people actually like your cupcakes in the, you live in the break room. She's like, huh. He's like, and then what do I do? I said, I don't know. Uh, yes, my business card. Maybe give me a call, you know? A couple of weeks go by, I get a call. Uh, I said, oh, who is this? You know, she's like, oh, the lady from the place. I said, oh, the cupcake lady. She's like, yes. I said, oh. it's like, what's going on? She's like, well, every Wednesday I bake cupcakes. I just sit. It's the best day of my week. You know, I just watch people eat the cupcakes. Everybody gathers in the break room. They are talking about how great the cupcakes are. It just makes me feel so good about it. I said, really? I said, yeah. She said, well, you told me to call you. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like people like your cupcakes, but that doesn't actually mean that they'll pay for the cupcakes. Why don't you do this? Put a little basket beside your cupcake. Put like one or $2 in it. She's like, well, they'll take my money. I said, well, it's one or $2. Just put it in the basket. It's like, uh, and then what? I said, I don't know. What have you been doing so far? Well, I've just been making cupcakes. I said, well, can you give me a call again? The following week, she calls me up. She says, well, Christian, uh, there's like $36 in my basket and a check that says, uh, please bake cupcakes for Joe's birthday for like $80. She's like, 
oh, this is overwhelming. What do I do? I say, what have you been doing so far? Well, I've just been making cupcakes. I say, well, keep making some cupcakes. Maybe you now you have a birthday party to make cupcakes for. She said, whoa, this is very exciting. I said, well, do you have a, you know, like a website or something? I don't do any of those. My daughter does Facebook. I said, well, why don't you do this? Just write your name and your phone number and put it in the basket so that people know who to contact you for cupcakes. She said, oh, that's a good idea. Uh, what do I do next? I guess I call you back. I said, sure, call me back. She calls me back like the following day, right away. She's like, I got another order in my basket. My daughter is going to build me a Facebook page. This is so exciting. I, I, you know, I'm not really sure what to do. I said, what have you been doing so far? She said, I've just been making cupcakes. I said, well, keep making some cupcakes. Maybe it's time for you to start to consider, like as you're doing this, you know, I'm happy to talk to you. Maybe go back to your friends and family and tell them all the stuff you've been doing. He's like, what does that mean? I said, well, you talked about a cupcake business. You know, you've been making cupcakes. People have been paying for cupcakes. That sounds like a cupcake business. I don't hear from this woman for months. You know, I get a phone call. You know, I've, I've saved her name in my phone as Cupcake Lady, you know? So I knew, I was like, oh, hello, Cupcake Lady. She says, hey. She says, I, I want to send you an address. Can you meet me at this address? And I said, okay, sure. What's going on? I said, please, if you can. You know? So the day comes, I drive to this location. She sends me. As I pull up to the location, I see a big sign. It says, now open the name of a cupcake shop. Underneath those words, it says, just make cupcakes. I go into the shop. This lady had hired four employees. You know, they walk in, they're clapping. She says, well, I've been talking about this experience of how I started my business. I want you to say a few words to the team about the journey. And truly, all I have done from the moment I met you, quitting my job that I've been in for 30 years, starting the show, all I have truly done is making cupcakes. And I share this because these are the very core of how I coach teams all around the world. Really helping them understand what their cupcake is what they need to get better at, wake up every day to try to get better at. In our discipline, we have to find what our cupcake is and we have to stick to it. It's been nothing but my highest honor and pleasure to do this with you, to share with you today, great session to start the year. Thank you all for your attention and the gift of your time. You have my contact, please reach out to me. We'll take oh, questions. Oh, amazing. amazing. I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was amazing and very inspiring. Um, and we do have time for some questions. So let's take some questions. Let's just scroll up because there was a first one. Yeah, here I go. Okay. So as a simple employee, so we have a question from Aviad Her Herman. Uh, as a simple employee, what can you do, if anything, to affect the company culture in cases it is not like what you explained? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Remember, um, I told you that trust is a two-way thing. It actually is easier people is that for leaders to actually start playing the role in a company. Meaning, I give you a good strategy and a good vision and I can back off and tell you the problems and allow you to do it. Now, what happens is if you cannot actually translate that into meaningful solutions, you lose their trust. You know, in American football or in soccer, for instance, if I'm passing the ball to you and every time I pass the ball to you, you keep dropping the ball or losing the ball, I'm going to stop passing the ball to you, right? So what I tell teams to do, get better at what you are meant to be doing. Discovery, being able to solve a problem, getting good at focusing on the customer, understanding your business, your industry, your stakeholders, building relationships within your organization. These are all the core elements of what makes you good at your job. Right? You've got to be able to respond because when the leader gives you the problem and sees that you solve it better than they would, then they feel confident about giving you more problems. But if they give you the problem and you're like, I don't know what to do here, or we cannot do discovery, then what happens? They say, well, I might as well just tell you what to do. Right? So you know, I, I challenge teams a whole lot. Raise the bar on your discipline. Understand what it means to be good at your job because trust is based on competence and character. I don't think people hire people with bad character. It's often a competence thing. I do not trust that you do it better than I would, that you have an answer better than I would. And so here's a trick that I use. If you, if you want a, 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 a black belt technique tip to help you break through your organization, 
find the loudest, most obnoxious person in your company. You know, it exists. You know who I'm talking about. The one that's always in open everybody's business. Humble yourself. Go to the person and say, I am an idiot. I know nothing. I don't know anything about the company. I'm not sure about how things work. I want you to teach me. You know what? I won't bother you. I'll just show up to your meetings. I'll sit in the back. I don't, you know, I just want to listen and learn from you. It's the only thing I want to do for the next week. I promise you this. That person will build a relationship with you. It's hard for you to sit behind them without them asking you personal questions. But here's the dynamic. People don't know that you know things. The way they know you know something is to test you. If I ask you, oh, what's one plus one? Everybody will say two. Who remembers the exact date that they learned one plus one was two? None of you do. And who cares? We just want to know that you know. So the best way for that leader to know that you know something is if they were responsible for teaching you. So by you going to that person and making them accountable for teaching you, you now have an ally. Because if you're in a meeting and say, why? Luis doesn't know something. That person will always defend you because if they don't, that means they're a bad teacher. And nobody wants to be that person. Plus you will build relationships with the most obnoxious person in your company. You become a powerhouse. Okay? All right. Okay. So um, what if a product leader have better sense, have better product sense? This is from Amnon Cohen. Okay, so what if a product leader, you have better sense than uh, one of the product team PMs? Uh, should you let them make the mistakes of wasting time, prototyping, whatever they think they want to test? or guide them directly or at least closer to the more probable solutions. Yeah, I love, I love that product leader. Thank you for your vulnerability in that. It's often the most dynamic. You see, I talked about competence trust. I know the solution. Why am I gonna allow the team to make all these mistakes to do it? Remember, your job is to do what? It's not to do that job. Solving the problem is the team's job. Your job is getting them better at solving the problem. If you solve the problem for them or tell them what to do, they will not get good at problem solving. So here's the technique I do. I say, why don't we solve the problem together? Okay, so as a leader, I put on the shoe with you and we partner together. I say, let's bring the problem up. And what I'm doing here, I'm doing two things. When I'm showing you how I solved the problem, how I got to the results that I thought was better, right? So that you're learning my process too, which may not even be great, but I'm also providing a safe environment that is not disempowering to you. Now, please don't do that all the time. If you do that a lot, that means you didn't coach them. <laughs> You're just doing their homework for them, right? So this is part of what we have to learn in our discipline. The job of the leader is different now. You, it doesn't scale if you keep doing that. What scales is getting people as competent as you are. You just, you know the best solution. How did you get that way? If you got 50 people to do it that way, you are scaling an organization. Okay. Okay. How do you, how do you find identified? I think this is from, a, uh, this is from Audrey and she's, she, I think she's interested in, uh, in, in finding a good company to work for. So how do you find identified company that have the right cultural leadership to get into? Any idea on key question to ask during interviews? I, I, I don't look for companies anymore. I also advise teams not to. I, I look for leaders, uh, you know, um, in some meaningful ways. And, and you've got to interview leaders in the same way that um, you, uh, you, they will interview you in some ways. People have to take this seriously. You know, I, I typically ask companies, do a 30-second pitch about your company to me. You know what I often get? I forget, you know, we have Fortune 1000, we're super cool, we're a great company, we are the fastest growing company, we have balloons and slides and we are great. And so I always say, okay, so why do you need me? You know, let me explain to you, people are attracted to hard problems, especially smart people. The number one recruiting tool is a company vision. Where are you going? What problems do you want to solve? That's the best way to attract the smartest people in the world. Have a big, crazy, cool problem to solve. But most importantly, if you think about the best teams in the world, the coach does all the recruiting. They don't outsource it. Many companies outsource it to a HR group or somebody. The coach is saying, I am building a team to solve a problem or to accomplish a goal. I know what is missing. I know the dynamics. I'm going to go and find somebody that complements my team. 
So what I tell people is you find a leader that creates an environment for you to solve and a company with a vision that you are attracted to, mm. right? No company on paper. I mean, what do they all, you've never seen a company that puts on your book, we suck, we are terrible, we are struggling, we're losing market share, but that's why they're hiring. If you've had all your problems solved, you don't need to hire anybody. So you need to understand that if you have a skill set, these companies need you to accomplish a bigger goal, look for leaders that, can, that, that you want to work for towards that mission, but will help you get better. Um, the question, is, it, is it okay if we go over? It is. I can do another 20 minutes if we need to. But oh, right. oh, that's Ooh. amazing. Yeah, we have so many good questions here and it's really, it's really inspiring. Um, so from Lior Snyder, um, how does coaching, how does coaching achieved in a squad organization? Yeah, so remember, uh, coaching is not a specialty. Your direct manager is your coach. Okay, I need to stress this out. People often talk, also talk about like, well, I have a mentor out there. Look, if you go back to my sports analogy, because my mind is that simpleton, you know, if you, if you, well, you know, if you made a bad play, your mentor will say, I gave you advice, you didn't take it. But a coach has your record, the same record as a team. When you win the championship, the coach wins the championship. When you lose, the coach also does it. Your direct manager is your coach. They have skin in the game. Their job is not to play the game, but to get you better at playing the game, right? So it is super important, regardless of the topology model, squads and stuff, uh, whether it's a functional leader or a metrics leader, there's somebody whose job is your responsibility as your hiring manager, but coaching is the number one aspect of it. What does coaching mean? Getting you to competency, you can do the job at the level that you're required, and then to your potential, you are ready for the next opportunity. That's the job. So for, from Amir Matalon, uh, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges for an empowered product manager in a B2B company? How does that differ compared to a B2C? No difference at all. Uh, and I stress this because I see product management like uh, being a, a doctor. Right. Of course, there are specialties. You could be a heart doctor, a surgeon, a different stuff. But at the root core of it, the, the role of a doctor is to diagnose a problem and solve the problem or cure. It. So the role of a product manager, regardless of what industry, specialty, I'm a platform product manager, a technical product manager, B2B, SaaS, enterprise, all the different variants. You might have specialties based on the kind of organization you might be in. But the core of your job is working together in a team to solve the problem in a way that works for your business and in a way that customers love, to find solutions that are valuable, usable, feasible, and work for your business. Same exact role, right? Will differ a little based on industry or specialty, but the core of the job is the same. Um, how do, uh, for May Mordechai, how would you recommend managers to learn coaching and learn how to ask being coached to empower them? I, I love that. I love that question. It's, it's a, a lot of where I spend my time. And I mentioned, uh, you know, the reason we don't experience good coaching is because many managers have not experienced good coaching. I was in a session a, a couple of weeks ago with a CEO of a big company, and I did a little coaching session with him, a kind of a blind coaching session, and he started crying. I said, what's going on? This is not what coaching is about. I'm not trying to. He's like, well, look, I've been CEO for like 12 years. And not a single person has ever asked me what I needed. Everybody's asking me what they can get from me and stuff, and they demand things from me. But you truly just asked me, we just identified what I need to get better. I didn't like say, go read a book. You were working on a plan to help me get better at that. I were not leaving me in it, right? So the best way to experience, to, to get better at a coach, I remember I said it, you're not gonna get better at this by avoidance. <laughs> Okay, um, we have a coaching series on our blog, um, our book Empowered. We've got you know 400 pages. Half of the book is on coaching because deliberately we find that's the biggest gap in it. So there are tools. There's a book called The Trillion Dollar Coach, which describes Bill Campbell's coaching journey. It's a good read too as well. Um, but there's not no substitute from learning from a good coach, right? Pick your spot. 
speak any uh, uh, skill. One of the best of the best people, they always have people that they've worked with that have been the best of the best, right? So be, be ruthless about trying to find somebody to help you get good at this job, a good coach. Um, from Anurag Mishra, um, how as a mid-level employee, one can ask tough questions or help leadership do a better job in setting expectations, leading an organization without really rubbing their ego the wrong way? <laughs> okay, going back to my uh, emotional intelligence black belt techniques. Um, remember, I talked about trust being two ways. And It's very common. It's unfortunate that the second you become a manager or a leader, uh, you've lost the ability to be stupid. You know, like you have to have all the answers, have all your crap together, be able to, you know, solve all the problems in the world. And so this corporate uh, misnomer fuels bad patterns of arrogance and a lack of humility in corporate America. Please don't go hurting that very fragile insecurity. It's not deliberate. So remember I said the best way to help your manager is for you to humble yourself too as well, right? And say you don't know, right? To solve problems together, to ask for help. You know, typically uh, uh, when I see a manager that tells you, hey, you're not good at communication, go take a class. I never send people to go take a class. The class may be teaching you something very contrary to what you want. I go take the class with you. I say, you know what? I found this communication class. Let's go together. Because imagine, let's take communication as an example. Who are you going to practice communicating with after you come back from the class? Somebody has to go with you. Plus, I'm going to learn what they are teaching you, see if it's the right approach. We're going to practice together because my job is to get you better. So typically, the way you don't hurt the ego of people is by you humbling yourself a little lower and creating a safe space for them to learn with you. So I will tell the leader, hey, can we go lend this together? Because I need help practicing. Can we explore this approach together? Because I need help, you know, uh, uh, being able to refer this to this later on, right? So you're seeing, uh, these are very deliberate techniques. If you're, if you're not scared as a manager, this is a full-time job. This is why I thought someone asked me the other day, can I have 25 employees? I said, okay, so let's say you had one important piece of information to tell every employee, and it took one hour to inform them. You need a whole week or half a week just to inform your team about what's going on. <laughs> I tell people as a rule of thumb, I have no more than eight direct reports because it's a very full-time job. But that means in a singular day, I can commit one hour to every single person. Right? That's because I'm talking about the importance of this job. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just to note, uh, the best thing I learned on that issue is from my partner, Orit, and she's, she taught me the best sentence for that is she said, I don't understand. <laughs> so it's, that always helps, helps everybody being better managers because yes. if, if she can take on herself acting as I don't understand, then people feel okay of not knowing. And that's, that's a very good state of mind. Yeah. So here's from Idan Arie asking, if you're working with outsourced developers, would it be harder in your opinion to explain to them why and avoid uh, treating them as mercenaries? Oh, it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, it, it is very tough um, because that's a cultural uh, misnomer too as well. Um, not impossible uh, if you recognize the problem with it, right? So. By outsourcing engineers, they are not like or development yet. They don't feel a part of the team. They are kind of work for hire. You know, I tell the story of uh, Hertz, the car rental company, suing Accenture for $32 million because <laughs> that's how much they paid them to develop their website. Yeah, crazy. But if you read the lawsuit, you know, Hertz says it's not mobile friendly. Our customers are happy, are unhappy. Accenture's defense was we did exactly what you told us to do. You signed off on the statement of work. Mercenaries will do things that are wrong, only they know it's wrong because that's what you're paying them to do, whatever you write down on the script. So the best companies, uh, they might have those outside, but they make them feel involved. They have shared outcomes. They badge you in that way. Very, very hard to do. 
because your parent organization or your outsource company may have different goals for you, may have different uh, requirements for what your work will look like, a different culture, but not impossible. So, you know, if I have to do that, what I do is I, I make sure that it's baked in their contract that they are part of my team. They attend every meeting, we every cookout, every event, they are on the clock the same way. Um, you know, we want to forget and we want them to forget that they don't work for us in that way. Like I said, very challenging, uh, much easier to just hire your own engineers, believe me. Um, yes, it might be more expensive, but trust is there's not a very nice price on trust. You know, I just talked about a company losing $32 million on one of those things too as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so Christian, this is going to be the last one, okay? Yeah. There's, we can spend hours here. <laughs> so inspiring and interesting. So for Madir uh, Tareto, uh, what are the attributes you seek in a product manager you interview and how do you recognize them? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And, and, and this has evolved for me um, over the years. Um, you know, one of my favorite questions is, is kind of posing a problem to a product person. I, I you know, I, I could pose a problem like I have a friend that is hearing impaired and he needs to wake up in the morning to go to work. Um, how you go about solving that problem? You know, alarm clocks don't work for him. So, and I threw that out because I want to see how people approach problems. Some of the best responses I get are people that say, I have no clue what to do. I'm like, oh, that's very, that's a risk to humility. And I said, okay, so what do you do when you have no clue? what to do. Engineers, what do they always do? They start solving the problem right away. They're like, yes, we're going to build a bed that shocks you and a dog that backs at you all night long, right? <laughs> and, you know, while that might be great, you're like, so how would you talk to the person? How would you, do you know sign language? They've not cut through all of those things, but product managers have to be able to identify what they do not know and have a willingness to admit what they don't know, but also to bring the people together that are necessary to solve the problem because they are focused on the customer, right? So I pose a problem in my interviews. I, I pick, you can pick whatever random problem that has some nuance to it. You don't, don't make it about your company. Pick something outside because you want it to be applicable to everybody. There's no gut here. It's not like they don't know your company. They're going to fail if you make it very specific. Like how would you build the next app in our business? No, that's a poor question, right? Just pick any problem in life. What you want to understand is how people approach problems. Are they intellectually curious? Do they ask lots of questions? Are they eager to collaborate with other people to solve the problem? Do they want all of the credits? Are they, you know, you're, you're just trying to break that down, right? And then I want to see the ability to push through, right? Uh, you know, I'm drilling them on, what about this? And, you know, they are relentless, but continuously focused back on the problem because that's the job. That's the job. Right? Of course, uh, you know, like I mentioned, um, I see many people hire people for potential, you know? Oh, you know, uh, Avid is great, not really a great product manager like I would like, but you know, they have potential. I don't mind that, but you must be willing to coach them. <laughs> if you're not gonna coach them, don't hire them. They will not magically get better. What you interview is what you're gonna get. <laughs> so I bring my whole interview team together. I don't do it alone. Right, because I bring other people to help me, especially the people that will be working with them to solve the problem. Don't get it wrong. Like uh, people watch tape of, about your company, they read the articles. You can read the articles about them. I tell my product people, go interview people that have worked with me before so that you can know what kind of crazy I am. You need to have the same expectations that you might have in here. But you know, the interview, you're looking truly. Uh, uh, not just that the, the character aspect, but the competence aspect of it. To be good at this job, you have to have a deep knowledge of the customer, the industry, the business, the data, and the product. You don't know our business, our industry, or our product. I have to teach you those things. But do you love solving problems for customers? Do you have an affinity to use data or information to get better? I can find those things out in an interview. And those are the things I'm going for. Good. Great. 
Yeah, do you are even waiting for that one question that you wanted to ask. So. No, I'm I'm waving because I want to I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time and Christians in, in the top of my list. I'm okay. I, I got a lot of answers and hopefully it's not the last time we speak. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's been nothing but a pleasure to do this and to share with this community. It's a really dynamic, fun group. So thank you all for having me out and, and for starting the year on this note uh, and sharing. I look forward to more opportunities to do so. And I just want to give you, give you like um, a really special thank you because I think that you answered things that were, you know, really um, unique to people's situations and you didn't try to like say well you know you just got to work this way and that's it and and thank you for that it's uh it's rare to get those kind of answers <laughs> so. oh. thank you everybody for coming and joining us um we'll be having a next month event uh, and we'll let you all know it's going to be an exciting speaker hopefully as exciting <laughs> it was today have a great year Wonderful. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year.